That was the ceremonial blowing of the shofar or screeching into the shofar. Uh, good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. And I, I obviously you should have your palm by now. We're going to have our children's procession very soon. So I just want to get us started early because we also have the choir performing here uh, today. They're going to be performing a number of pieces from their cantata. And so uh, thank you just to begin with. And Pastor I will be offering a message uh, to help you prepare for this Holy Week. Um, I just do want to mention before I go through with this Holy Week, radio broadcast is sponsored by Ann Barr. Altar Flowers are sponsored by Bob Hitchens and in memory of Lorene Hitchens. So um, thank you for that. And thank you, this, this week is full of so many different things. We just had a, a breakfast this morning. Thank you for all those who came and enjoyed those really good eggs and, and pastries and such. So thank, thank you men for doing that. Food tends to be something that we include in anything that we do. So Thursday is gonna be a Seder meal. You can still sign up to be at that Seder meal. Uh, Friday, we have a Good Friday service here at 7 o'clock. Then on Saturday, we're going to have a special um, Saturday service with some uh, one particular uh, skit or play about Perpetua, who is one of the early Christian martyrs in the church. So I um, hope you can be here um, on that. We have a number of people from our congregation who will be performing in that, um, that small play. Then, of course, Easter, and we'll be beginning with a 7 o'clock service, and then we'll have a time of like, a, oh, like a co extended coffee hour until we have our service at 9. Following the 9 o'clock service on Easter Sunday, we will have an Easter egg hunt for the children. So um, bring all the children that are here and more <laughs> next week uh, for that. We have... Lots of eggs. Did we get enough candy? We got a lot of candy? All right, so we're set. We're set. Bring your kids. And um, there's also a couple other things, uh, some again focused around food. Uh, Leanne, do you want to bring everybody up to date on? Thank you. Um, for United Women in Faith, this is your last opportunity to go ahead and pre-order your chicken casseroles. The orders are due in the office by tomorrow, so you can still, if you need to, you can call and talk to uh, Judy and Julie and say, hey, I forgot to order. Can you have them put my order on the list and I'll drop off the money later or something like that? That's absolutely fine. We understand. So. Uh, the uh, insert in your bulletin is there today. You can fill it out, drop it in the offering with your money if you happen to have it, or again, just give them a holler. Um, we thank you, uh, as always, for your support and uh, all the fundraisers we do. I wanted to encourage all of you. In the Narthex, there is a Stephen Ministry Holy Week devotional, and our Stephen ministry team, each one of us has written a personal uh, devotion for each day of Holy Week starting today and, of course, ending at Easter. So this is available. It's on a table. And also, Pastor Kack and I are going to try to work out something so an email will be sent every day with the devotion to the church members. And, f and finally, just a little bit of information about we're going to have the palms come in. You have your palms. And following the service, we're going to, if those who would like to walk around the block, uh, proclaiming the joy of Jesus' entering in to Jerusalem, bring your palms. We're going to be walking around the block, and uh, we'll be blowing the shofar <laughs> as we go uh, to announce to the world that uh, Jesus has arrived. Uh, so again, following the service, we'll meet out in the parking lot. We won't leave until you're there. So please join us, and then we take the traditional uh, walk around the block. And so for now, what we're going to do is 
start with our prelude, then when Hosanna, loud Hosanna uh, begins, we're going to stand, if you're able, and sing 278 as our children enter. Thank you so much, children, for coming forward. Thank you, Sunday school teachers. Happy Palm Sunday to all of you. Thank you for marching in and hailing Jesus as King. I invite you all to now go sit on your, uh, with your parents on the pews. Can we give them a hand, please? Good morning. Good morning. If you will, please join me in the call to worship. Humble and riding on a donkey. We greet you. Acclaimed by crowds and caroled by children. We cheer you. 
moving from the peace of the court side to the corridors of power. We salute you, Christ our Lord. You are giving the beast of burden. A new dignity. You are given majesty. A new face. You are given those who long for redemption. A new song to sing. With them, with heart and voice, we shout. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You may be seated. And please join me in the unison prayer. Almighty God, on this day your son Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of victory and great grant bear them in his name. May I ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray, amen. And if the children will come down, please, for the children's moment. Good morning. Hello, how are you? You guys did such a good job in waving the palms when we got down from the center aisle. That was fantastic. Do you know why we do that? Does anyone have an idea why we do that? We do that every year because we have a celebration on Palm Sunday. Well, let me just explain it to you. Do you guys come to Confest? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. And sometimes you come to see the parade. You know how the parade happens and we see all the nice things that pass on the street and we wave at people, we watch, watch different nice things that come down that represent our whole community. Have you seen that parade? Yeah, sometimes, okay. So you know Palm Sunday was a big parade, big procession that happened long time ago in which people came and they picked up palms and they were waving it to someone. Guess who was waving, they were waving them for? Just like you guys did today, you demonstrated it for us. They were waving those for Jesus. And you know, Jesus was coming down the road and they thought Jesus is so good and fantastic and such a loving person, caring person. They'd all love Jesus. So they wanted to heal the palms and put them on the street for Jesus. They also actually took off their robes and put those on the ground, and then Jesus walked on them. But Jesus didn't walk on himself. Guess what happened? I want you to see that picture on the screen. We have a picture for Palm Sunday. Well, Jesus was riding a donkey. Did you guys know that Jesus was riding a donkey? and going around and people were like hailing him saying, Hosanna, this is the king. Welcome uh, Jesus to our city, Jerusalem. And I have a little donkey right here. Don't you think he's kind of a cute stuffed donkey? You just wanna pass him around? Yeah, you wanna check it out? Well, the donkey was very important for Jesus. Everybody was thought, well, Jesus is such an important person you can, you can share it and just look at it. Yeah. So, you know, Jesus is such an important person. So why is he riding a donkey? Do you guys wonder why Jesus would be riding a donkey coming on a big parade? Do you guys ever think? Well, let me just tell you. Jesus decided to come on a donkey, but not on a horse. Usually people come on horses, you know, in a parade, right? 
or they come on fancy trucks or fancy cars in our days. But in Jesus' time, an important person always came on a huge, big stallion if they were going to be the center stage of a parade. But Jesus chose to come on a donkey. You know, does any of you know how to make a sound of a donkey? No. Can you try? No? E O? No, okay. I don't think he wants to risk it. Yeah, it might sound weird, but E O, E O, I don't know. I've heard them make funny sounds many times. They can be really stubborn too. But most of the time, donkeys are known to be very humble animals. They're very humble because they're also called beast of burden or somebody who carries heavy, heavy load. They carry it for someone else. So Jesus wanted to be a humble servant of all of humanity. So he, instead of choosing a horse, he chose a donkey to come to tell everyone that he serves them out of love. He loved everyone so much, so he didn't come on a horse like a, like a soldier, but like a humble person, just like a humble donkey, you know, to serve others. And that is why he chose a donkey. Actually, a baby donkey. They say it's a colt. Have you guys seen a baby donkey? Yes. You know, we had one around Christmas here, but he refused to come in. He just stayed right there at the door. The sheep and the llama came in, but the donkey was kind of not liking it here. But he didn't come in. But he was really nice. We enjoyed him. So next time you come down, to church and you're healing palms, remember you are actually welcoming Jesus when he came down on a donkey to be recognized as king. Isn't that nice? Yeah? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I want all of you, you have one? Yes. You can all take one if you don't have one and then later on after church we're going to walk around the block, you know, doing the same thing like you did right here. Just telling the whole world that Jesus is king. Okay? So I have actually miniature donkeys for all of you. They're actually gifts from Pastor Keg, and he was very generous to uh, share them with you. So all of you, each family gets to take one. Okay? So this way everybody will take one home. All right. Can I give you one? Very good. Would you like to take one? Okay. Let's see. And oh. Harper, would you take one for your family? Would you like to take one? All right, Lily. And then Charlie. Very good. Oh, thank God. I'm glad we have enough. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for coming. I hope you look at the donkey and you remember why Jesus you know, came on a very humble animal to be recognized as a humble king. So shall we pray? Let me, let's join our hands and close our eyes and let us pray, okay? Gracious Lord, we thank you for our children because they hailed you as king today in our worship. Just like the children of many, many years ago hailed you as you walked in Jerusalem. We ask for your blessing upon each and every one of them, all the children in our church. Lord, continue to be king in their hearts. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for coming. You can go back to your places. Donkeys are wonderful, you know, and they've got such personality, and when they go, hee -haw, right? It just makes you laugh just to hear them. Uh, and Jesus, that's what he wrote on this humble donkey. He wasn't on a great big steed or anything like that. He rode in on, on a donkey. Humbly, we go before God. 
We go before God humbly with our various prayers. I've received one prayer, and uh, it's one of, of thanksgiving and joy. Julie Fahey was elected, and now mind you, this is very rare to have anyone elected as Speaker of the House of, uh, it's Oregon? The House of Oregon. So, um, I, you know, I think she, even though she's not here, she deserves applause to take something like that, a responsibility like that on. So would you just uh, offer applause for that? <laughs> Tough service. She's gonna be busy. How long is that election? Is it an annual election? So how many years? Every two years. Okay, so um, she'll need our prayers, <laughs> all right? So um, other prayers that we want to lift up of uh, Thanksgiving, of course, this morning, prayers of thanks for our choir in singing uh, today. Um, are there any other, just really quickly, any other prayers? Because I didn't announce to turn in your prayer card earlier. Anyone have a prayer of joy or a prayer of concern? Very quickly. Anyone? Let us then be in an attitude of prayer as we offer our prayers this Palm Sunday. Dear loving and gracious God, this is a week filled with joy and also filled with sorrow. This week we'll see the best of humanity and we will see the worst of humanity. It is a mixed bag. As you know, you came to increase us as loving people, forgiving people, compassionate people, but you have also came to help us when so often we are not. In leading people, Julie will have to deal with both. We pray your strength upon her to bring the best out of us. As Christ lived and died and rose again to bring out the best of all that we can be as individuals, as a community, and as a nation. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us this coming week as we offer these prayers, prayers of hope for what is to come. Amen. And finally, we offer this prayer that he taught us and that we say when we gather together our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So church, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we are reminded how people way back 2,000 years ago, Jesus entered into Jerusalem and people gave gave of their time, gave of their attention to him, and also out of awe for him, put down their cloaks in his way. We, in our awe of what God does in our lives, give of our time and our gifts and our talents. So I invite you all this morning, in that same tone, to give of your offerings and give thanksgiving to God for what God is doing in our lives and in our church. 
to invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offerings. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road, shouting Hosanna as Jesus passed. Lord, we are looking for a Messiah who continues to live in us, abide in us, and use us for his glory. Accept our offering this morning. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Today's passage of scripture comes from Psalm 118, 19 through 29, and John 12, 12 through 16. Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festive procession with branches <clears throat> up to the horns of the altar. 
You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. John 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord and the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it. And as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written on, of him and had been done to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Ty, for reading those very important passages for this season of Holy Week that started right today for Palm Sunday. You know, we are all familiar with processions. Um, you know, processions make a town or processions make a city because they gather people to focus on one thing, their attention on one thing. When I came to Morris, I was told many times to make sure you attend Confest and the parade that's going to happen. And so we were very excited, me and my family, and we did attend the parade for Confest, and it certainly did not disappoint. It was full of exciting things and wonderful things from our community and persons and schools and dances, a lot to enjoy. So yes, Confest is, was a, a comparatively smaller procession, but then came the other procession. Santa came into town that December, last December as well, and another huge procession with lights and music and fanfare. So much to enjoy. So much to enjoy. Of course, the scale gets bigger if you look at bigger processions. Thanksgiving parade in New York City is a huge thing. My kids have always wanted to go there to see the blow up. Uh, images of different characters, and especially children enjoy going there to be part of that celebration. Huge procession. And as last as I remember, our Chicago land experienced the last big procession when the Cubs won the World Series, 2016. I heard that that was one of the big processions on Michigan Avenue, downtown Chicago. Maybe it was a long-awaited win, but finally we had one. And let us not forget this coming November, we're going to have elections. We're going to elect a new president. And come January, that president is going to walk in a procession at the Washington Mall. Another thing everybody gathers, maybe not in person, but on television to watch. So processions have importance. The most processions have a short memory, unless reminded by someone, unless you want to recall a historical fact. Processions can be topped by the next big procession. And all the more so, the church takes an extra effort to remind its believers and the world, because our church is worldwide, that Palm Sunday was a very important procession that happened 2,000 years ago, when Jesus walked into the city of Jerusalem triumphant. He had the attention of the international scene of that time. And that is the reason why I chose the passage that uh, Ty read from the Gospel of John. John, which is the most latest of the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke come much early, uh, John comes some 90 to 100 years after the resurrection. He puts everything in a perspective that makes more sense to us because we are so far away from that incident. And he points us to three important 
points of this particular procession and historical event that I think it would be important for us to look at so that we can fully understand the importance of who this person Jesus is that we claim to be our Lord and our God. So yes, um, John, who you know, puts this account right at chapter 12, whereas his whole book is uh, chap full of 12, 21 chapters. That's how long the book is. But chapter 12 starts this story. And the rest of the whole gospel is all about the passion of Jesus. Because that's how important it was for first Christians or the early Christian church to, for believers to fully understand the gravity, the enormity of what Jesus accomplished in this week, what we call Passion Week. Today starts Passion Week, and then we see Jesus journeying to the cross and to resurrection. It's very important for us to fully understand what that means. So John wants us to grasp the mystery of this man, this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And he will go into detail to help us understand well, one of the ways that he helps us to understand is the fact that he wants us to have a, what we call a panoramic view of not just the, is this incident or this event, but a panoramic view that encompasses the spiritual aspect as well as the eternal perspective of Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever been on a hot air balloon ride? Anyone? I know Deanne has mentioned yesterday. Anyone else? Okay, we have a few people. I have not had that chance, but my daughter recently went on one, and she was so impressed, um, very impressed. She said, Mom, you have no idea how it changes your perspective. You know, we who are always on the ground, on the roads, and in our homes, maybe we take a few, you know, flights, a uh, uh, few stories up, or maybe if you go in a high rise, you get a multiple story up and get a view. But nothing like a view from way up in the sky. When you see things that you would never see um, otherwise, a perspective from on top. And in some way, John is helping us understand, please look at the perspective from the top. And, and I don't mean literally look at the landscape, but to understand it spiritually and understand it eternally. A perspective from the top. So yes, Jesus comes. Okay. This is not, there we go. <laughs> Jesus comes into town and is being hailed as king. And the city is up in roar. Everyone is gathered. Those who know him, those who believe in him, as well as everyone who had gathered here for the feast of the Passover. They want to see this man, Jesus. Why? Because he's very popular. He has just raised Lazarus from the dead. He has fed 5,000 people with literally like a free meal out of two fish and five loaves of bread. He's doing miracles. Who doesn't want to see him? So they come joining the crowd, hailing him as he enters on a donkey. A big procession. They say somehow in this particular time, there were close to over, over 2 million people present in Jerusalem. The other aspect that John brings us to attention is that this was not the only procession that happened that day in Jerusalem. See, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the east gate, but Pontius Pilate had entered Jerusalem from the western gate. And Pontius Pilate did not come like Jesus did and did not have that much attention. He came with his whole grandeur presence. He entered Jerusalem to go to his home in Caesarea, and his entrance was a bit terrifying with all his military gear. He was staged on top of a stallion and he displayed the Roman might. He wanted to show with his grandeur presence with his trail of army behind him. 
to show the crowd present in Jerusalem who is ruling this space. In many other accounts, it states that he was forcing peace. Make sure you keep peace otherwise. In John, we see that kind of a contrast. We have one hand, someone who is humble and known as a prince of peace. And another hand, there's someone who comes with might and power, enforcer of peace by force. A sheer contrast. Then John wants us to understand that this is no simple account because Jesus is very much in control of his coronation, very much in control. He selects who he's going to ride. He sends the apostles, go get me a colt of a donkey. Of course, I would be thinking, disciples, we are so happy you're finally out. You are such a powerful man. You have accomplished so much. You have taught us well. You have done marvelous miracles. We are so happy that you're out, out and about in public. But you're going to come on a donkey, really? Maybe we can get Jesus a horse. No, he selects what he's going to ride on. And that's like I was explaining to the kids, this huge symbolism around a donkey, and especially a colt, because usually if a new king is to come, they inherit the previous king's ride, maybe a stallion or a steed, so that there's a transfer of power. But Jesus was not transferring no one's power. His power came from God. And that's why he wanted a ride that was never ridden before. This and many other symbolism are attached to the ride on a donkey, a humble beast of burden, a humble animal, symbolic of who Jesus is, king in his power and might, but humble in his service, in what he is to accomplish. You see, there is, uh, I don't know if you know, Cory Ten Boom, is a very important and historical figure of uh, uh, the 20th century. She was known, and her family was known, for helping uh, Jewish families during Holocaust to be prevented or saved from the murder at the hands of the Nazi Germany. She saved, and her ha family worked very hard to save a lot of Jewish families. And at the end, she was the only surviving member of her family through all that turmoil. And she received a lot of acolyte, a lot of recognition. And one of them was called, um, uh, the, she was recognized to be called the Righteous Among the Nations in 1967. Righteous Among the Nations. And many people thought maybe that would make her proud. And, and they asked her, Does, how do you... How do you manage to be so humble, Corey? And her response was very interesting. She said, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey, then everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments on the road and singing praises. Do you think that for one moment, if ever, it entered the head of the donkey that any of that might be for him? Oh yeah, I'm a donkey. Everyone loves me. She said, do you think it ever occurred to the donkey's mind? Then she continues, if I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ rides in his glory, I give him all the praise and all the honor. In many ways, we are in some ways Humbled from the fact of what Jesus had accomplished on the cross for us. Humbled from the fact that if we can fully understand how Jesus becomes our king, we won't mind being the donkey that he rides. And in many symbolic ways, maybe many of us are being that humble ride, even in our present day age, that God can accomplish things by riding through us and through our lives to accomplish his tasks in this world. Last but not least, um, John says, well, all this happened, but at first his disciples did not understand this. 
what's going on? Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. The disciples didn't realize at best they were just confused. They were just startled what had gone around Jesus this holy week, being charged, being tortured, being put on the cross for, and killed, and then he rose again. They did not understand. They did not understand this procession. They did not understand his intentional coming out to be recognized on international scene. But afterwards, they did. It, it, actually, 50 days after, the Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit came and the disciples were fully awake, spiritually awake, fully comprehending what had happened. And in some ways, we are with them. Maybe many times challenges of our lives, you know, struggles of ups and downs, celebrations and uh, maybe tragedies of life distract us. Distract us and move us away from the normality of what Jesus had accomplished. From the fact that this man, Jesus, actually freed us from so much. If we only pl keep plugging into him, we have the best of life in this world, and the best of life to come. So yes, it speaks to us today. We sometimes do not understand. We sometimes do not uh, comprehend the reality of Jesus and what this man, God, continues to do in this world. So John is giving us eternal view through this historical account and helping our attention to be drawn to this man, Jesus. Jesus offers us a moral compass. In this world where morality is on the down, knowing right and wrong is very important. He gives us the moral compass. He is the light in the world. He helps us to distinguish between that which is false and that which is true. Jesus is our savior. He eliminates our sin debt. Takes away the guilt and depravity of death. And he is our powerful king. He heals, he restores, he binds up, he puts together many who, who entrust in him in this life. And then he gives them the promise of everlasting life. These are some attributes of Jesus that shine out if you live like a believer. But today we are very fortunate that the choir is gonna sing some other attributes of Jesus, which are even important for us to comprehend and understand. They are going to sing to us that he is the word, he is the lamb of sacrifice, he's the bread of life, and he went on the cross for each and every one of us. So let us prepare our hearts to hear the cantata. Amen.
from the very beginning, Jesus was coexistent with the eternal God. In three years of earthly ministry, he pointed others to the loving creator of the universe, inviting them to be united with God in a life of faith. Thousands embraced this humble prophet and his message, believing him to be the long-awaited Messiah. As Jesus and a band of his closest followers entered the city of Jerusalem for the Jewish Passover celebration, they were greeted by great crowds of people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Behold the Holy Lamb of God. Passover week in Jerusalem was typically filled with a blend of joyous celebrations and quiet reflections. It was a time for Israel to recall God's faithfulness over many generations. As Jesus gathered his disciples to share the Passover meal, they did so with a grateful look to the past and a confident assurance of God's presence in their lives. In the moments that followed, though, these followers became quickly aware that things were about to change. I have eagerly anticipated eating this Passover meal with you before I suffer, Jesus said. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it comes to fulfillment in the kingdom of God. As they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Then he took a cup of wine, saying, Take and drink, for this is my blood poured out for you.
Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, choir members, for starting our Passion Week for such beautiful, inspiring pieces of music and words. May God continue to bless you. I invite you all to join us as they continue to lead us in praise on Good, uh, Good Friday and then Easter Sunday, and we'll come back Easter Sunday to continue our celebration of resurrection. Go in peace. Lord be with you. <laughs>